Welcome to the Tuesday Weekend, the podcast that has eaten all of their Thanksgiving leftovers by now. Uh, not yet. I am Josh Hobson, and with me is bartender Nick Parkin. Nick, how was the family visit? Uh, it was great. Got to uh, go have a nice relaxing time. Got to have the nice big spread of food. Just didn't have to work. That was fantastic. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, um, also, uh, going back to a previous episode on breakfast and stuff, when we were talking about hash browns, mm-hmm. mashed potato hash browns. Yeah. So you got to sear them so they get a crisp on them, but they're really, really good. Yep. Little butter, little oil, get that nice crust on the outside. Okay. Yep. Well, in December, we are going to take a few weeks off because I will be taking a road trip back east to see family. And that means I will be at my dad's place on my birthday so he can make a sucker tort for my birthday cake. It is the only birthday cake I actually want. Growing up, my friends got the store-bought sheet cake with the brightly colored, overly sweetened frosting. My dad would always make a soccer tort, which is a dense, not very sweet chocolate cake from Vienna that has a fruit layer. And now he would allow whoever's birthday it was to choose any flavor of preserve they wanted for that fruit layer, either apricot or raspberry. I bring up birthday cake because today we are talking about celebrations and what is a celebration without food and beverages but before i go any further nick is there a particular birthday cake that you prefer yes and it's no longer available so that's where we're at yes uh, no there was a uh, the little cake place around uh, capitol hill and uh, they would make cakes with uh, almond flour mm-hmm. and that's where my mom got my birthday cakes for decades but they were really, really, really good cakes. Like the only time you had that cake was on a birthday. It, it wasn't a sheet cake. Yes. It was layered. Um, I preferred the dark chocolate with the raspberry. Sure. And absolutely loved that cake. And I just, I found out that just recently, maybe in the last year or two, they kind of hung up. Oh, that's true. They, they were family owned and all that and just decided. But it was, it was weird too, because it was a place like over on Capitol Hill that was, it was in a house. Oh, cool. Like it's like someone lived here, someone lived here bakery someone lived here someone lived here and the bakery looked like one of the houses on the street actually the breakfast restaurant in franklin that that immediately brings to mind was yeah in a converted old victorian home and it was really cool and of course they used the outdoor you know, backyard seating yeah as far into the fall as they could looks like great. the breakfast place in logan herms is you're in a suburb and it's a house sure well it's a big house but it's a house <laughs> and Kind of getting off subject a little bit, but into city planning, the notion of front yard businesses or, you know, like a, a garage converted yeah. into a barber shop or into that little vegan bakery or something like that, I think is a great use of land. Yeah. And especially in the suburbs where you're not really going to get a lot of redevelopment for more density, it's a great way to actually kind of pack in some commercial businesses into a walkable neighborhood. So try it, folks. See how it goes. I'm not to change the subject. Uh, my bar building right now is there uh, doing the uh, restoration or touch up or whatever you want to call it. I am currently living in a real version of the money pit. <clears throat> Anytime I ask anyone who works on the bar how long it's going to be, they say two weeks. When I asked them before I took my leave, it was two weeks. My leave was two weeks. A week later, it was still two weeks. Saturday, it was two weeks. They're like, what are we done in two weeks? And I'm like, you were supposed to be done in two weeks. It's not, it's been almost four weeks now. It's been over a month. I'm literally working on a banquet bar. The casino I was at had plans for some, a major interior renovation. The building is 19 years old. And so a lot of it is yeah. just outdated and needs to be updated. And that renovation was supposed to start in July. So a good part of it could be done before we hit this time of year. The work has not yet begun. So yeah, my, mine was supposed to start in March. Yeah, no, exactly. At this yeah. point, it's being pushed back to, I believe, mid-January. But that's assuming there are no further delays. But it's also not really my issue anymore. Yeah. So let's talk a, a little bit, getting back to holiday food and drinks. Um, let's start with the beverage side. And of course, the holiday drink that I think of first is the really weird one, eggnog. Nick, what are your experiences, opinions? To be perfectly honest, I absolutely love the non-alcoholic version of eggnog. Sure. You can kind of cut it with some milk to make it a little less noggy if you want, if you think it's too heavy and all that. That being said, I am not a big fan or proponent of adding alcohol to dairy. 
almost ever. I usually am not either. This really is, I suppose, the one exception that I make. Yes. Uh, when you get into it, you're really just looking at what kind of alcohol you want in your eggnog. I mean, whiskey's going to have a bit more of a bite. Rum is going to actually go perfectly into it, and you're not really going to notice it. Vodka, you're an alcoholic. Um, <laughs> what I really enjoy is actually the honey whiskeys. And I, the one that I I've used that, yeah. is the wild turkey honey, I think goes really well. But I also tend to make it rather than buy it because it's essentially a creme anglaise that you then just thin out. For anyone who has baking experience or pastry experience, it's not that difficult. It just You just have to stir it. You know, also uh, saying with that uh, honey whiskey, instead of doing an, a nog, you could almost do a tres leches cocktail. Ooh, yes. Not that I think about that. I mean, if you want a flavor comparison for something you can do liquid wise, go get the Hagen Dost Tres Leches ice cream. Sure, sure. A bar down the street, and this is last year. I don't know if they're doing it this year or not, but they did a cinnamon toast crunch eggnog. The bar manager, Ella, would be going to Costco and filling up one of those flatbed carts of mm -hmm. all of the cinnamon toast crunch they had at Costco every week so they could keep making it. <laughs> Sure. And it's very time consuming and it's a pain in the ass, but everyone loves it. I'm going to actually check tonight and see if they're going to do it again this year or not. Because mm -hmm. I don't think they really want to because it is very labor intensive to make something like that. I mean, an eggnog, it's a great yeah. cocktail and it's a really nice holiday one, but it's something you want to make in bulk. You don't want to do singles. So when I was a liquor manager in New York City, that the the over the Christmas holiday, I made it would be five gallon batches at a time using the yep. big stock pots in the kitchen. And I would make one every morning because, well, a you third know. of it would just be drunk by the crew. Just <laughs> no additional liquor. How's that taste? Yeah, exactly. Pretty like, good. <laughs> Let me try that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Really? I can smell that. And like, great. Go ahead. Time and labor intensive, but also really especially if you don't have a huge restaurant or a huge number of guests to serve, it's really pleasing. Most people enjoy it. All right, sure, it is not everyone's taste. And yes, there are people who do not mix their dairy and alcohol, and I'm with you on that. But for them, mulled wine and cider. Exactly. So, but like you said, also eggnog is, that is the cocktail du jour this time of year. I am trepidatious about going into Christmas time because I know my new F and B manager is going to want to do some sort of eggnog and I'm going to have to look at the recipe and figure out how to fix it. And that's just one of these drinks that's not really in my wheelhouse. And I know it's gonna be coming down off the internet and it's gonna show me how to make it. And I'm gonna be like not saying a word, going like you're doing everything wrong. I could try to dig through my recipes and see if I still have mine from New York, because I believe I do. Uh, if you do, send it to me. I'd love it. Yeah. Anyway, well, the other winter cocktail, because you you said it, and it's not really a celebratory cocktail, but is very much a cocktail of this time of year is the hot toddy, especially with all the, the celebrations you're having once you're around all those germy kids. You're yep. going to need something to help with all the congestion and sore throat. Honestly, the hot toddy was the drink that we had as kids, yes, that my mother got the recipe from my grandmother who was Mormon, and they don't drink at all. But this was medicine, so this was fine. Sure, exactly. And your, and your straight up hot toddy is, it's, it's, it's an ounce and a half of whiskey. Now, she used Jack Daniels specifically because I think that's what my grandfather hid around the house for himself to drink. Uh, and then ounce of honey, ounce of lemon, and top it with hot water. Stir it until the honey dissolves, and that is your hot toddy. I have told friends many, many times, hey, you don't feel good. You're a little congested. Have a hot toddy. Here's how you make it. I talk to them the next day, and I'm like, how do you feel? They're like, I don't feel that good. And I'm like, well, did you have a hot toddy? Like, oh, those are good. I had four or five. And I'm like, <laughs> one. You're supposed to have one of them to feel better. Correct. Not not going to drinking binge of hot alcoholic beverages because also a warm alcoholic beverage will get into your system faster. Mm -hmm. Again, kids, your body absorbs alcohol. You don't digest it. Just remember that. Correct. Yeah. Are there any other holiday cocktails you, you want to bring up before I get to the holiday food I want to discuss? Um, the holiday cocktails, normally you're just you're making Christmassy type things. You're you're pretty much creating cocktails that taste like food. I mean, you're, you're right now. I've got a friend of mine down at a bar last night. She was working on a sugar cookie cocktail. Right. The cool thing was is that they have what what they call butterscotch is literally butter fat 
scotch, where they've taken butter and put it into the scotch. The bars around town have already put their cocktail lists up for Christmas this weekend, and uh, there's a lot of cocktails I want to go try. Even at like a family Christmas party, my my father made fudge, um, very very good fudge, and he had one recipe that was basically a white fudge with candy cane in it. And looking in, you know, the family liquor cabinet that we all have, where there's you know alcohol there from the 70s, going like, wow, they haven't used this label in 30 years. Wait a minute, I was able to recreate that fudge using just ingredients and stuff to make a nice cream peppermint cocktail. So Christmas cocktails, when someone says do something Christmassy for a bartender, as long as you have the ingredients, it's super easy. The one thing yeah. I've seen attempted, but I've never actually seen a, a really successful way to do it is rimming a glass with crushed candy cane. Get you just have to get something stickier than a lime or something like that. Um, you almost need a two to one simple syrup. Right. Because oh, sure. you want something sugary on the side That's of the glass to hold those bits. A glue on the side of yeah, the glass. Yeah, literally is what you're looking for. I mean, an orgeat would work great too. Or, you know, hopefully if you have a really, really good blender like a Vitamix or something that can basically turn wood into liquid, if you throw your candy canes into that, it should powder them. Sure. And that should make it easier. The one thing about Christmas drinks is it's a one month thing. I'm not going to have someone come in in, you know, May and say, hey, can I get that? that peppermint cream thing you made back in December. It right. just, it doesn't even cross someone's mind, but as soon as we click over to December 1st, that's all anyone wants. Hot drinks, Christmas sure. drinks, you know, mold wines. They want uh, all spice and pretty much everything. Yeah. Or yeah. a chocolate creme de mint. That's called a grasshopper. Yeah. I, I it, it, tastes, it tastes like a thin mint. They're mint. fantastic. But yeah, I mean, it's also that nice green color. Anything that's green or red is considered Christmassy right now. There's all the green drinks you can make, and red is just basically grenadine and anything, I guess, Basically, if you want to do that. The one holiday food I want to just bring up very quickly is fruitcake. And now, if you are under 30 and have ever tried a fruitcake, I want to know. Tell us about it in the comments, because it really, to me, sorry, Dad, is kind of an older person thing. Yeah, I mean, and also fruitcake for any family is like potato salad for any family. First off, yours is the best. Oh, sure. And second, there every every single household has a different recipe. My my dad has an actually edible fruit cake that he makes compared to a lot where I take a bite or two and then well, it depends on the setting. I will often politely eat it just, you know, if it is made for me, but you know, my dad's is actually pretty good. I enjoy it. My grandfather had the same thing, had a recipe that was and, you know, didn't know it at the time, but it was actually sensational because then later in life, I'm like, oh, there's some fruitcake. Yeah, I try that. And I'm like, I like my grandfather's fruitcake. Sure. And I'd be like, oh, my God, what is this? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm looking around for the plant or a napkin to spit it out. Like, what is in my mouth right now? I don't think I'm going to live through this. What, what is this dense brick that you have? And just... then realizing immediately, like, the fruitcake that I associated from childhood, which was actually very good, is not a typical fruitcake because... As I've tried them now, just to see how different they are, they're usually abysmal. There's no happiness in them. And it's a fruit. It should be happy. And you, you, you're like, oh, so this is what they stood in line in Russia for back in the 80s. Right. right. There's no joy in this. There's game. no joy in this fruit game. Oh, geez. That was the one other th uh, note that I wanted to make relating to, well, cupcakes more than cakes, but cupcakes, donuts, and ice cream. Sprinkles are for winners. Don't go around giving everyone sprinkles like it's a participation trophy. You earn your sprinkles. That's I completely agree 100%. Yeah. And on that, we are going to take our first break, and we will be back to, to talk about large gatherings. Stay tuned.